All right, welcome. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the sixth Sawyer Seminar at UC Davis. Special thanks to Marilla, Marisol de la Cadena, Mario Blazer, Christiana Giordano, and Susanna Sawyer, who along with over 25 graduate students have dedicated the year toward thinking with our visitors. Also to Ingrid Lagos and Magali Rabasa, who have kept us all organized. Today we have the very special pleasure of a conversation between two amazing scholars, Isabel Stengers and Donna Haraway. This is at least their third public conversation over the past seven years. YouTube versions of them are available. This is also Haraway's second appearance in this room. And I want to therefore begin by thinking with a comment she made in an interview. She said, I've taught a course called Science and Politics for a number of years, and one year in particular, it was very early in the morning, a big lecture class at 8 a.m. To get to the lecture hall, we all passed through this little shop that sold good coffee and chocolate croissants. And just as a way of waking up in the morning, I would ask people to unpack objects, to take a chocolate croissant and lead me through flour and chocolate and butter and sugar and coffee and connect us to the world histories that way. I would ask people to pick an object, the t-shirt that someone was wearing, what was printed on it, the label, the fact of labeling, the fire composition, fiber composition. If it's got polyester, take me through the history of DuPont, Purity Hall, research labs, you know, back me up into nitrogen chemistry. If it's cotton, then back me into pesticides and California water projects where cotton is grown and the length of the fiber and what are you wearing on your chest. I would ask people as a way of talking about science and politics to get the class started, to give me an account of it. So I begin with this quote because it points to a way of asking questions about the world that implodes it into lively living histories of technology, capitalism, and science. Haraway's approach in much of her writing involves making us all accountable to the sciences that we are entangled with, not as any simple critique, but in order to unpack the ways in which the stories we have about our relations, the common sense ones we are often only dimly aware of, are not the only stories and the only ways of engaging with the apparatus of the university, for instance, that we are deeply imbricated with. There are also other stories, she insists, and constantly demonstrated. There are better stories. Haraway began her academic life as a biologist and turned to the history and critical studies of science, co-teaching with scientists. In her writing and teaching, she never wants us to forget the joy and importance of doing and learning science, while at the same time the joy and importance of doing and learning feminist theory, post-colonial studies, Marxism, post-structuralism. She is now Emeritus Professor of History of Consciousness at UC Santa Cruz, which seems to mean she has more time to write and think and play with others, including dogs, of course, as her most recent book, When Species Meet, calls forth. Stangers began her academic life as a chemist and was fascinated with, quote, what the reproduction of a discipline involves. She went on to study philosophy and was deeply influenced by Jill Deleuze's difference in repetition. Returning to work with her former chemistry professor, Ilya Prigogine, who needed her philosophical insights to put into words the notion of dissipative structures, she published two books with him shortly after he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Stangers then went on to the job she currently holds, Professor of Philosophy of Science at the Free University Brussels. Michelle Serre awarded her the Grand Prize in Philosophy at the Académie Française. Author of over six books, or 13 depending on which country you count them in, Isabel Stengers has written with and about chemistry, Galileo, hypnosis, psychoanalysis, psychiatry, and the science wars. Her stunning book, Thinking with Whitehead, is rippling through academia in the US, teaching us how to see more in the world in a way that allies us with the bet of science. Haraway, too, has been thinking with Whitehead since her undergraduate days and her graduate days with biologist G. Evelyn Hutchinson, and counts Whitehead among her modest witnesses. Stenger's ongoing multi-volume work on cosmopolitics has also been recently translated into English. Stenger's co-writes with many of the scientists she works with, interested in interrogating the adventure of science, finding out, quote, what unites experimenters, what forces them to become active and think together. This often requires a laboratory and always peers. Thus, she writes, one can certainly ask scientists many things, but not to renounce what matters to them and particularly what resonates in the question, is this publishable? The primacy of the objections of competent colleagues who keeps one's writing from being over hasty. It is from the inside of laboratories that Stengers poses risky and far-reaching questions of matters of concern, of what concerns scientists and how this might be extended by them with due attention to the world which they presume to say something about. We social scientists and philosophers equally learn from this due attention. At the risk of a simple complementarity, Stengers could perhaps be said to traverse the critical territory between science and the world and the other direction from Haraway. Where the latter starts from the world to find science and make it accountable to stronger objectivity, 
Stenger starts from the scientists and the risks they take and finds that science can be better and stronger precisely by being more scientific and caring for the world it makes words about. She calls this civilizing science and philosophy. Both have found power in the work and imagination of Starhawk and science fiction. In words and practices, risks and questions, these are two researchers who have taken the threads of objectivity and ethics from the hands of previous philosophers and historians of science and have made a new cat's cradle out of them for us to enjoy critically. Please join me in welcoming them. So the way this is going to work is uh, Isabel will uh, give her presentation followed by a discussion by Donna and then we'll have a short break and we'll come back and have responses. Thank you, thank you a lot for your welcoming words. And thank you for, to Marisol, who convened, uh, who convened us here about around a very challenging theme, challenging for me at least, the reconstitution of worlds. And it is challenging because of Marisol's challenging demands. When I wrote the last of my seven cosmopolitics books and named it The Curse of Tolerance, I did not know Marisol and her relentless insistence that we discuss concrete situations, concrete political clashes between worlds. In other words, that I address matters of direct conflict. Her insistence puts me between a rock and a hard place. Either I shamefully recognize the dreamlike quality of the very idea of cosmopolitics, or I accept the invitation and claim for ideas a power they have only when it is a matter of blessing the ongoing so-called modernization of the world. A power which they have now less than ever. The gulf between what is being done and what is known we should be doing has to me never been as wide as it is now. I still remember hearing in 1995 that for the first time a majority of the French population thought the future of their children would be worse than their own. Conceptually, it was an event, since it signified the end of the trust in progress, that is, of the major disciplining hold on thought and imaginations. This event has got some undeniable consequences, surely. But it has not thwarted what now proceeds in the name of globalization and the inescapable duty to accept sacrifices in the name of competitivity and growth. In Europe, one of the most visible consequences of the end of consensual reference to progress is the new vi vitality of nationalist xenophobic political movements in those regions which feel in better position and wish to get free from the burden of solidarity with poorer ones. Vi victis resounds about everywhere today. If we have to speak about concrete situation, I just think that we should agree that there is a common point between Marisol's own question about political ontology and my cosmopolitical proposition, which is, I will explain, about civilizing modern practices. Both have the character of a speculative conceptual construction, even a fabulation. This means that in order to try and think together, 
No blow below the belt should be admitted. No direct references to situations where we deal with real political hegemony. Our respective arguments about the reconstitution of worlds and about civilizing European-born practices are, as we will see, distinct ones. Oh, I believe so. Maybe they, they will be able to converge. But they both demand the development of their conceptual space, never to be confused with actual matters of affairs. It may be objected. What are concepts good for, then? So, a little biography. I began to think the need to civilize the way your American moderns think of themselves at the time of the so-called science wars, when confronted with the furious clash between scientists and critical thinkers around other words like rationality, objectivity, or universality. Struggling against modern hegemony by showing that any knowledge is a matter of representation only was to me a bad or at least a dangerous strate strategic move. It was a di direct declaration of war entailing the mobilization of furious scientists. Concept may have a power indeed. Here the concept of representation everything is a representation, produced a self-confirmative effect, confirming that scientists were indeed as such part and parcel of modern hegemony, claiming for themselves the universality of objective knowledge. As for the concept of practice I then introduced, it was not a peaceful one. I, it rather aimed at dividing scientists, at offering them the possibility to betray the hegemonic conquest machine called science with a big S, blindly, unilater unilaterally imposing so-called objectivity and rationality over whatever exists. <coughs> In other words, my proposition was an attempt to propose a space for thought and negotiation against the crushing power of mobilization and counter-mobilization, a space in which the monolithic figure of objective knowledge would not rule, in which the idea could be formulated that sciences, in the plural, did not even do not need to be what they are now. Critical thinkers knew that if they wanted to debunk scientific claims, they had to go for the head to directly attack those sciences, theoretical experimental sciences, which claim access to the objective reality of the world. I, on the other hand, proposed to reformulate such claims. First, <coughs> to turn objectivity into an achievement, the very point of the experimenter's specific practice would be to achieve the enrolling of a non-human, to have it endorse the role of reliable witness for the way it should be characterized, and then to cheerfully admit that it happens that they succeed in this hope. What matters here first is that endorsing, having the non-human to endorse the role, endorsing is not imposing. If experimenters felt insulted, it is because the critical reading is denying this difference, which is their primordial matter of concern. For them, the scientist, I mean, experimental scientist, the definition of an experimental achievement is the ability to refute objections, implying that an interpretative frame may have been imposed on a mute reality. My bet was that if the possibility of such an achievement is recognized, they themselves may in turn admit its very particular, even exceptional nature. And maybe then, they would even realize that the worst insult against their practice is to use the same word, objectivity, to characterize the general reduction of any situation to objective terms and their own uh, to, to, to characterize in the same way 
the general reduction of any situation to objective terms on the one hand, and their own passionate attempt to create experimental situations, empowering a difference between relevant questions and unilaterally imposed ones on the other. If they did accept that, new question would become possible. If one dramatizes what the experimental achievement both demands and presupposes, nobody can think of it as a model to be blindly or methodologically extended. How indeed to extend a practice which demands and depends on disembedding what has to be enrolled as a witness, that is, uh, which has to be redefined in terms of the question it should answer, and so doing may produce indeed reliable witnesses. A practice which furthermore requires the intrinsic indifference of the prospective witness to the meaning of the experimenter's question, because the behavior should answer the question, not the being. If the being answers the experimenter, there is no reliable witness. Instead of a general ideal of objectivity, the unifying thread of scientific practices could have been then the commitment to create very particular situations which confer on what scientists addressed the power to make a crucial difference for what concerns the value of their questions. If relevance and not authority or objectivity had been the name of the game, another way of following experimental science, it would have meant adventure, not conquest. What would have been produced is a positive radical plurality of sciences, each particular scientific practice answering the challenge of relevance associated with its own field each crafting the always particular achievement which it will call a scientific fact, each being able to present itself in terms of their particular achievement. This is what I mean with the idea of civilizing scientific practitioners, practitioners who would know that it is an insult against their own practice to present it in terms of general attributes such as objectivity and rationality, this implying that their achievements are normal, that their difference with regard to others to, to whom they present themselves is only that these other, others are lacking objectivity or rationality. Practitioners also would know that what follows from their achievements should never claim to replace the answer other people give to their own questions, because the answer they themselves achieve always coincide with the creation of new adventurous questions, never with new authoritative answers to questions that already mattered for these others. As you may have understood, the idea of civilized practitioners is as speculative as the idea of political ontology. The main difference is that it builds on the position, on the possibility to take seriously what critical uh, thinkers wanted to demystify. Also, it may as such entail consequences of interest for those researchers whose concern for relevance is thwarted by the blind imperative associated with objective knowledge. Now, what is the power of ideas again? There is something like tragic comedy in this episode of the science war, because it happened at the very time when the tug of these wars was being disposed of through completely other means. At the time when I was speculating about the possibility of a peace implying the reclaiming by scientists of their practices, Donna Haraway was asking us to think in the presence of Uncomos, the patented mouse created to suffer for women. The second millennium science, or science, was no longer the practice of experimenters like Robert Boyle, a practice which could be reclaimed because of the special character of its achievement. 
we already knew that conquering, destroying, blindly objectifying never needed reliable witness, uh, knowledge and reliable witnesses for the relevance of questions. But we had now to understand that competitivity is generally indifferent to achievements and rather requires flexibility, requires that scientists accept that the knowledge they produce is good enough if it leads to patents and the satisfaction of stakeholders. If what is called knowledge economy has its full way, what has been an insult for scientists, that their knowledge is a matter of representation only, will indeed be verified. It is not, however, the kind of verification critical thinkers should be happy about. It means indeed that the social fabric required by the concern for reliable witnesses has been destroyed. Scientists will not need any longer that their colleagues object and test their claimed achievements. There will, and there are now, other means to succeed, which depend on other interests, on promises able to attract in the industrial partners. If objections against the weakness of a particular claim may lead to a general weakening of the promises, promises, promises of a field, nobody will object too much. Dissenting voices will then be disqualified as minority views that need not to be taken into account as they spell unnecessary trouble. What may well prevail then is a general wisdom that you do not you do not sow off the branch on which you are sitting together with everybody else. What is bound to happen then has already got a name. Prom promises, promises again, economy. When what holds protagonists are glimmering possibilities, nobody is interested to, an to assess any longer. Knowledge economy means that speculative economy, bubbles and crash economy, is now taking the control of the production of scientific knowledge. I certainly do not mean that the case is closed. I mean that we live in the very interesting time when the conquering and redefining machine of so-called modernization is turning against those who felt they were the very soul of human progress. This machine may run without the need for reliable knowledge, just as it may run without the need for a general trust in progress. Correl correlatively, new opposition appears, which may be a chance for recalcitrant scientists. But this chance is a testing one. Allying with those who struggle against destructive redefinitions, would demand that scientists present themselves in what I just called a civilized way, in what Donna Haraway would maybe call an actively situated one, divorcing any ambition to confer to their knowledge the power to define a situation which matters for others in different ways. The question of an ecology of knowledge or, or or of practices, scientific and non-scientific practices, is no longer a question of academic peace or war. It is now a question of political and practical struggle against what is in the process of indifferently destroying all practices, all diverging ways of, of having a world matter that is also imposing everywhere the imperative of, of general flexibility. But at this point, I fear Marisol will be dissatisfied with her question. How indeed can this ecology, this capacity to link, uh, to present oneself in a civilized way, in such a way that you do not answer the question of the other, that ma the divergent uh, way things matter, uh, is what makes the bond? How how indeed can this ecology extend to other than human persons, to Pachamama or to what is not a, a mountain, but this mountain, a powerful being whom indigenous 
people's name, respect, and fear as such? Can we avoid the curse of tolerance, that is, avoid politely recognizing that it matters for them, but still st softly thinking that we know better and have just to tolerate those respectable customs? Ecology is about the testing coexistence of effectively diverging practices and valuations. But are we able to admit that we are bound to coexist not with humans who name Pachamama what they value, but with Pachamama herself, with her own ways of demanding attention and of requiring consideration? More precisely, are we able to do it not not in a rhetorical way only, but in time of stress, when hard decisions have to be made, when the claims and rights of different stakeholders must be, must be measured and debated. Here we come to a question which extends well beyond the problem of separating scientific practices from general objective knowledge. I certainly approached this question with the idea of cosmopolitics. But it was a tame approach in comparison with Marisol's question. Indeed, I proposed to keep the term politics in its Greek sense, meaning a gathering of people who feel free to negotiate an issue, their respective knowledge and experience may diverge as much as one can wish, but in the Greek sense, they all accept that it belongs to the collective deliberation to assess the way each knowledge and experiences will contribute to the, to the issue that gathers them all. The prefix cosmo was there to signal the limitation of such political process. People's, peoples may indeed refuse that collective deliberation so defined, so defined collective deliberation, will dispose of what concerns them. That is also dispose of the demands of a concerned other than human entity. They will cry, if you decide this, you will destroy us, or else if you decide this, it will mean war. With this cry, it will mean war, other than human entities, did enter the cosmopolitical scene. And together with them, the need for what I characterize as diplomacy, the resolutely agnostic practice of achieving partial connections liable to articulate diverging worlds, liable to produce a crafted peace in situations where war seems the logical outcome. But it seems to me Marisol asks more with her proposition of a political ontology. I had meant to civilize politics through the, the intervention of diplomacy when needed by the issue. Marisol wants to ontologize politics. She feels, and this is true, that the curse of tolerance may well lurk in the distinction between politics and diplomacy. She feels, or I think she feels, I feel she feels, <laughs> that the cry, you will destroy us, even if it may cause a fright in the political assembly, even if it may effectively disrupt the collective deliberation, is not affirming the strict equality between peoples, which is a primordial concern. In her terms, other than human entities should not mean a disruption of the political deliberation. They and their peoples are to be recognized as political protagonists, and this implies a complete reinvention of politics, then cut from its great origins. That radical reinvention of politics, which Marisol proposes, also bears on what we call equality. As we mean the concept, as we know the concept of equality and of politics were born together, both of Greek origin. Through equality, or the Greek word isonomia, 
Greek aff Greeks affirmed the uh, homogeneity of the space gathering a political community. Such a definition of political communities may be extended without too much problems to the spokesperson of non-human entities, as in Bruno Latour's Parliament of Things. Indeed, for all partic participants in the political assembly, things are then defined as a matter of collective concern. They are what needs the divergence concerns of all those who may contribute to unfold their concrete, that is, entangled reality. Ooh. But isonomia means the exclusion of those who would present themselves as the spokespersons of other than human entities. This seems to me the very difference, at, at least as I would propose it, between the now familiar claim that Earth is a more than human world and the question of other than human entities. One does not unfold an other than human entity. It is not as such a matter of shared concern. And we cannot ask it to share our concerns, to become protagonists concerned by our issues. I may be concerned by the way to address pilgrims to the Virgin Mary without insulting their faith in the transformative encounter which will give a meaning to their pilgrimage. But I cannot claim to be concerned by the way she herself will answer to my attempt not to reduce her to a matter of mere belief. This is not an objection against Marisol's political ontology, rather an attempt to formulate the conceptual problem we may be encountering when we do not limit ourselves to the, li to the maybe a little bit too reassuring case of Pachamama. This case may be too reassuring because here fright may be shared by all. I am not frightened by the Virgin my answer to my goodwill attempt, uh, or not goodwill, serious attempt not to insult pilgrims. But here, here fright may be shared. We may all agree that the earth has been mistreated, and we have all to face the rather frightening consequences of the modern irresponsible careness. She, it is understood a bit late, is, an, is indeed an awesome, frightening being. Also, the word respect, in this case, may be shared in first approximation, as it also designates the urgent need to learn how to pay attention to what has been recklessly ignored. Many are thus ready to accept the need to respect what some call Pachamama, and here is precisely where I need to slow down in order not to reduce other than human entities just to what would demand that we learn again the art of paying attention, which we have lost and should recover. If I feel the need to slow down, it is because again then, we would enroll other peoples in our own scenario, leaving them no place of their own, asking that they be wise where we have been foolish. I know this is not at all what Marisol intends, but she comes with a very different experience than, and mine is about the difficulty to avoid being self-entrapped by our dreams of lost innocence and return to the Garden of Eden. I need here the protection of the cyborg to escape a history of sin, guilt, and possible salvation. When addressing, as I will know, what I experimentally call the challenge of animism, I need to remember Donna Haraway telling us that innocence and the co corollary, co corollary yes, insistence of victimhood as the only ground for insight has done, has done enough damage. Why now the challenge of animism? As we all know, whatever their scholarship, 
The diverse definitions given to such a general category as animism bear the stamps of their origins and can hardly be disentangled from pejorative colonialist associations. The mature white adult male who has accepted the hard truth that is alone in a mute blind world is then able to define the past as what leads toward him. And his first duty is then to resist any seduction leading him back to this past. Thou shall not regress, sounds like his first commandment. When addressing the question of animism as implying to take seriously not only peoples who address other than human entities, but these entities themselves, I would take seriously the power of this commandment not to regress. As you may have remarked, my proposition about civilized scientists, the ecology of practice, and even cosmopolitics do not contradict, do not directly contradict this commandment. They simply complicate its meaning. In a way, they only articulate it with a world that would not be mute, but just more than humans. In a similar way, many authors evade the question of animism or tame it. We all feel the commandment, even if we are trying to negotiate its consequences. It would even seem that this commandment has over us the power of an other than humans and injunction. We are afraid, really afraid, that if we betray it, all our resources for thinking will be destroyed, and for instance, the very meaning of politics and of equality. A very interesting case of reverse cosmopolitics indeed. It is us who cry, do not demand that we feel free from this commandment, Marisol, or you will destroy us. The challenge of animism is to me a point where at last a strange equality is achieved. Obviously, it is not sufficient to follow the apparently daring path of Philippe Descola, a French anthropologist, proposing to put on the same quadripartitioned plane your modern so-called naturalist, together with animist, totemist, and analogist. That's his Descola sign. <laughs> Only, and Descola agrees upon that, what he calls a naturalist would imagine such a plane where other people's way of thinking and perceiving are assembled on the basis of materials brought from faraway worlds and organized in a Parisian office. And only a scientist speaking in the name of science would confront without fright other scientists proposing them to recognize that what they address as nature identifies them as belonging to one of his four cases. As for us who are bystanders, when scientists' contradictory arguments thunder, we may certainly wonder whether and giving to neurons the power to explain a way of organizing and understanding the world is a case of naturalism, or whether our organizing schemes may indeed be explained in terms of some neuro neuronal attractors. But what we know well is that we, who are not authorized scientists, cannot intervene in those fights any more than a mortal could intervene in the Olympian gods' quarrels. Even philosophers, although they are self-proclaimed inheritors of Greek reason, and theologians, inheritors of the monotheist creed, have no voice in the matter. Let us not speak of the old lady with a cat, claiming that her cat understands her. Those thundering scientists are certainly non-civilized. But can my fabulation about civilized scientists help us about this challenge? What if scientists 
<coughs> what if scientists had accept as a primordial constraint to address whatever they address only if the situation ensures that the addressees are enabled to take a position about the way they are addressed. What could have been obtained then, in this fabulatory perspective, may be what Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari called a rhizome, connecting heterogeneous practices, concerns and a way of having a world matter, a kind of ecological anarchy, but I would insist, not a free-for-all connectivity. Indeed, while connection may be produced between any part of a rhizome, they must be effectively produced. There are events linking, sim linking like symbiosis, for instance, what is and will remain heterogeneous. Civilized scientists may well play, may well play indeed in this perspective the role of diplomats creating such rhizomatic slings. And we know anthropologists nowadays play this non-innocent role. But the art of diplomacy has its own constraints. Diplomats are situated by the partial character of the connection they may achieve. They will never address conflicting ontologies as such, but always work with what, they, what may be possible in a local, always local situation. Leibniz, who invented philosophy as diplomacy, was accused by his contemporaries not to believe in anything. Herr Leibniz glaubt not. Not to believe in anything. He believed in peace as a possibility. Civilized scientists would also believe in possibility, in a possibility, the agnostic possibility of rhizomatic connections. And as such, they would be protected against the challenge of animism. But to be protected against a challenge is not solving the problem of the challenge. Other among our own practices may be of interest in the matter of the challenge of animist as the art of healing. The half-forgotten case of magnetism offers an interesting case. At the end of the 18th century, magnetism was defined in terms of its therapeutic efficacy by Anton Mesmer and his followers. But it rapidly overflowed this first definition, and the passionate interest it generated during the 19th century blurred any boundary between what was usually opposed as the natural and the supernatural. Nature was made mysterious, and supernature was populated by messengers bringing news from elsewhere to mediums in magnetic trances. A very disordered situation, which understandably provoked the hostility of both scientific and church institutions. It has even been proposed that psychoanalysis was not the sub subversive plague that first Freud boasted about, rather a restoration of order. It provided the means to explain away mysterious cures, magnetic lucidity, and other demonic manifestations now pigeonholed as purely human and bearing witness to a new universal cause deciphered by science. A distinct operation was attempted by the surrealist poet André Breton, who claimed that the strange by magnetic effects should be taken out of the hands of both scientists and physicians, who mutilate them through polemical verifications, dominated by the suspicion of quackery, self-delusion, or deliberate cheating. For Breton, the point was not to verify what magnetized clairvoyants were seeing, or to understand enigmatic healings, but to cultivate lucid trances, called automatism, in the milieu that really needed them in order to escape the shackles of normal representational, representational perception. It was for Breton in the milieu of art 
<coughs> in the milieu of, of art that should be learned and cultivated the demanding exploration of the means to recuperate what he called a psych psychical, psychical force. Breton proposition is interesting, as the milieu of art could indeed have been a supportive, sustaining one, allowing for the fostering of the unsettling effects associated with magnetism. Such a milieu would perhaps have been able to produce its own practical knowledge about trances, a knowledge applying to effects indifferent to the confrontation between natural, that is, demystifying causes and mysterious ones. However, Breton's proposition was an appropriative one, marked by a typically modernist triumphalism. To him, art was supreme, not a craft among other crafts, but the final advent of the surreal, finally purified of superstitious beliefs, he indeed fully obeyed the commandment ordering us not to regress. In contrast today, as we know, and as yesterday, healers and people looking for a healing path joyfully betray the commandment Shamans are everywhere. However, this betrayal is tolerated. We take it for granted that people who are looking for healing, and by extension, those who take in charge healing by an orthodox, not database means, are somehow lost, unable to bear their duty, not to regress. So this is still not the answer to the challenge because those who betray it are excused. I would now address the question from another perspective. It may be that the problem is not that of betraying the commandment and joining us not to regress. Nor is this commandment something we should merely repudiate. This would indeed communicate with the idea that the challenge of animism could be evaded just by escaping the power of the injunction. A rather bad idea if this commandment has over us the power of an other than human injunction. This would destroy indeed the kind of strange equality which may be obtain, obtained we, if we consider that we also are frightened. Again, we would be those who are frightened by nothing, purely political creatures. I have learned that peoples who know how to relate with other than human entities know well that such entities have to be recognized and honored if they are not to become devouring powers. Civilized, cautious relations with them have to es be established and sustained. And here may be a more interesting path. I would propose that our intellectual, imaginative, affective milieu is indeed infected by, by an ins insatiable, devouring, addictive habit. We are demanded to feel that we are bearing the high responsibility to determine what is entitled to really exist and what is not entitled to do so. Scientists are infected, of course, as well as those who accept their authority concerning what objectively exists, but might be infected also those who claim to be animist if they affirm that rocks really have souls or intentions, as we have. It is here the really that matters, an emphasis that marks the polemical power associated with truth. Coming back for a moment to the anthropologist Philippe Descola's classification, I would guess that those who are categorized as animist have no word for really for insisting that they are right and others are victims of illusions. It may well be 
that the power of the do not regress commandment, which makes of animism such a terrible challenge, may be related uh, with the infective habit, with, the, with this infective habit, with the dramatic character of the idea that other, other than human entities would really exist. This would mark the devouring power of what we have failed to recognize and honor. Instead of repudiating this power then, I would borrow the word reclaiming from US activists. Reclaiming, as you know here, <laughs> I have to explain it in Europe, means recovering what we have been expropriated from, but not in the sense that we would just get it back, in the sense that we have also to recover from this very expropriation, to regenerate what this expropriation has destroyed. As a first step in the reclaiming operation, I would propose to try and diffract the power which the commandment do not regress as over us, to break it up into, many, into the many occasions where it may be felt that we are taken hostages, separated from what we were trying to think by such insidious words like, do you really believe in? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I received as a shock an active transform transforming one, not a reflexive one, the cry of neo-pagan witch Starhawk. The smoke of the burned witches still hangs in our nostrils. Certainly, the witch hunters of the past are no longer among us, and we no longer take seriously the accusation of devil worshipping that witches were victims of. Rather, our milieu is de defined by the modern pride that we are now able to interpret both witchery and witch hunting as a matter of social, linguistic, cultural, or political construction or belief. We are those who know that neither the devil nor true witches, whatever this means, really existed. And we forget at this occasion that we are the heirs of an operation of social and cultural eradication, the forerunner of what was committed elsewhere in the name of civilization and reason. The point is obviously not to feel guilty. It is rather to open up what William James, in his will to believe, called a genuine effective option, complicating the power of the injunction, do not regress, demanding that we situate ourselves, that we reclaim this past. And here comes the true efficacy of Starhawk's cry. Reclaiming the past is not a matter of dreaming to make some true authentic tradition resurrect, of healing what cannot be healed, what has been eradicated. It is rather a matter of reactivating it, and first of all, of feeling the smoke in our nostrils, the smoke I felt, for instance, when I hurriedly emphasized that no, 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 I did not believe that one could resurrect the past. Learning to feel the smoke is to activate memory and imagination. Regarding the way we have learned the codes of our respective milieus, derisive remarks, knowing smiles, often judgments, often about somebody else, but gifted with the power to pervade and infect, to shape us as those who will be among those who sneer and not among those who are sneered at. Is it then possible to reclaim animism, to disentangle it from the devouring challenge to have to accept that other than human entities really exist? It was only a first step. Here now I will call to my help another ally, David Abram, whose spell of the census claims to offer an animist account of rationality. Animism here is no longer an anthropological category. When David Abram first met shamans, it was with the project to relate their craft with his own, 
being himself a slate of hand magician. The point was not, however, to reduce this craft to a matter of illusion. In French, we speak about illusionists also for slate of hand magician. For Abraham, what those so-called illusionists artfully exploit is the very creativity of our senses. The way, I quote, the senses themselves have of throwing themselves beyond what is immediately given in order to make tentative contact with the other side of things that we do not sense directly with the hidden or invisible aspects of the sensible. And this does not mean at all that Abraham explains magic away. Indeed, or sense as Abraham characterized them, rather respond to suggestions offered by the sensible itself. In other words, if there is an exploitation, the magician himself is exploited, as his suggestions are offered not only by ex his explicit words and intentional gesture, but also by the subtle bodily shifts that express that he himself participates in and is lured by the very magic he is performing. Our senses, Abraham concludes, are not for detached cognition, but for participation, for sharing the metamorphic capacity of things that lure us or that recede into inert avail availability as our manner of participation shifts. Shifts, but he insists, never vanishes. We never step outside what he calls the flux of participation. What is so interesting to me in this approach is that it allows Abraham to conclude that we ourselves are indeed animists, but a very particular kind of animists. When we look at small black signs and experience that they are speaking to us, we are both animated by the signs and animating them. Instead of telling about the disenchantment of the modern world, Abraham thus tells us about the strong enchantment or spell of the written text, more precisely of the alphabetic text, the only text which presents itself as self-sufficient, as able by itself to have us, I quote, hear spoken words, witness strange scenes or visions, even experience other lives. And he proposes that this efficacy be recognized as an animating magic, a strong magic, as he experienced itself when he came back in New York from countries where the written letters do not rule. He then felt fading away the lure of the stones or the birds or the rivers he had learned to listen and talk with. And quote, only as our senses transfer their animating magic to the written wo word do the trees become mute, the other animals dumb. David Abraham nevertheless writes, and passionately so. I would propose to take the experience of writing as a first antidote against the compulsive insistence of the either-or alternative which dismember experience, which demands that we decide, is an other than human entity really addressing us as an intentional subject would do, or is a so-called natural is it is a so-called natural phenomenon just triggering what we would what would really be of human provenance? Writing is an experience of metamorphic transformation. It makes one feel that something other than human indeed, which we often call an idea, demands from the author some kind of cerebral that is bodily contortion, making us larvae, wrote Deleuze, whereby any performed intention is defeated. For me as a philosopher, this first antidote brings with it the temptation to relate animism as characterized by Abraham to such philosophical ideas as Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, idea of an assemblage. Indeed, an assemblage for Deleuze and Guattari is a coming together of heterogeneous component 
as such a coming together is for them the first and last word of existence. I do not exist and then enter into assemblages. The manner of my existence is my very participation in assemblages. I am not gifted with agency, the possessor of intentions or initiative, animation, agency, or what Deleuze and Guattari call desire, belong to the assemblage at such, including those very particular assemblages called reflexive ones, which produce an experience of detachment, the enjoyment of critically testing previous experience in order to determine what is really responsible for what. I may also be tempted to relate assemblages to William James' radical empiricism with its affirmative non-demystifying promotion of experience, of the full fact of experience. I mean not of experience as critically purified, dismantled into an experiencing subject and an experienced object, experience again as an ongoing flux of participation. However, relating animism to radical empiricism or to the efficacy of assemblages is a dangerous move because it may well reassure us a bit too easily. We do not fear the suspicious gaze of the inquisitors. We do not feel the smoke in our nostrils when pondering sophisticated philosophical ideas. We are protected by the academic assemblage we participate in. But most of all, we are protected by the fact that we are pondering what Deleuze and Guattari or James have written down. Alfred North Whitehead wrote that after the symposium where Plato discusses the erotic power of ideas animating the human soul, he should have written another dialogue named, and he should have called it The Furies, which would have dealt with the horror lurking within, I quote, imperfect realization. The possibility of an imperfect realization that is of not recognizing and honoring as such what animates us at the risk of turning it into a devouring power is certainly present whenever transformative metamorphic forces make themselves felt. It may well be, however, that it is dramatically so when ideas are concerned, as testified by our violent history, was Once written down, indeed, ideas entices us with the temptation to assimilate them to expression of the author's intention and to enter into discussion with this author, thus turning what had been the experience of writing into the expression of the author's intention. A human author has been writing something and we, the readers, are replaying in order to understand or criticize it alternative versions of this purely intentional activity. How then could we grant this kind of intentionality to other beings? In other words, as soon as we freely entertain the ins and outs of the idea of assemblage as it is written down, the text imposes itself as of human provenance only, unable as such to thwart or, ju or judgment that animism is a typical anthropomorphic fantasy. This is why it may be better to revive more compromising words, words which have been academically restricted to metaphoric use only, without ins and outs. Magic is such a word, and we freely speak of the magic of an event, of a landscape, of a musical moment, and so on. Protected by the metaphor, we may then express the experience of an agency that does not belong to us, even if it includes us, that does not address us as intentional agents, but us as lured into feeling by something else by something which may or may not be intentional 
We do not know. And what is more important for my argument, we do not really care. Reviving magic, depriving ourselves from the protection of metaphor, will attract the gaze of the inquisitors and also inseparably activate the sad, monotonous, critical or reflexive voice that whispers that we should not accept being mystified. This voice may also tell us about the frightening possibilities that would follow if we gave a critique, the only defense we have against fanaticism and the rule of illusions. This is precisely one of the reasons why neo-pagan witches like Starhawk call their own craft magic. Naming it, so, naming it so, they say, is in itself an act of magic, because experiencing the discomfort it creates, we may feel the smoke in our nostrils. Worse, they themselves have learned to cast circle and invoke the goddess, she who the witches say returns, she to whom thanks will be given for the event that makes them, each of them, all and all together, capable of doing what they thus call the work of the goddess. So doing, they put us to the test. How can we accept such a return or regression to supernatural beliefs? The point, however, is no longer to wonder whether we have to believe in that the goddess, that contemporary witch, which is invoke and convoke in their ritual, really exists. The commandment, do not regress, is floundering, losing its grasp, because these witches perfectly know the little voice inside us. They did know it for themselves, too. Indeed, if one said to them, but your goddess is only a fiction, they would probably smile and ask us whether we are among those who ignore that fiction as a power to shape us. And if one wondered about the danger of fictions that may capture and enslave, it may well be that they would answer that the debunking of illusions is a rather poor defense against such dangers. What they themselves cultivate as part of their craft, as it is probably part of any craft involving other than humans, is a practice of immanent attention an empirical practice of realization, or to use Whitehead's word, <coughs> to use Whitehead's words, or of diagnosis about what may be toxic. A practice which or addiction for the truth that defeats illusions as too often despised as mere superstition. Contemporary witches are pragmatic, radically pragmatic, experimenting with effects and consequences of a craft which they know is never innocent and as such involves care, protections, and experience. The witch's ritual chant, she changes everything she touches and everything she touches changes, could surely be commented in, on in terms of assemblages because it resists the dismembering attribution of agency we do not know if change belongs to the goddess as agents or to the one who change when touched. But those are reflexive questions, while the first efficacy of the refrain is in the she touches. The recalcitrance against dismembering is then no longer conceptual. It is part of an experience which affirms the power of that the power of changing is not to be attributed to our own selves, neither to be reduced to something natural or cultural. It is part of an experience which honors change as a creation. Moreover, moreover the point is not to comment, as I am doing. The refrain must be chant, chanted. It is part and parcel of the practice of worship of our reception, as Whitehead would have. Thus, David Abraham and neo-pagan witch Starhawk 
both informed me that if magic is to be reclaimed as an art of participation or of luring assemblages, assemblages inversely are to become a matter of empirical and pragmatic concern about effects and consequences, not a matter of general consideration or textual dissertation. I would claim that we who are not witches do not have to mimic them in order to discover how honoring change exposes to academic sniggering. The Haraway, together with Cayenne, showed us a road. But we all know that this road is not a speedway to be enthusiastically rushed into as another of those famous academic turns. We also, as the witches, have to learn how to cast circles that protect us from insalubrious, infectious milieu without isolating us from the work to be done, from the concrete situation to be confronted. Our pragmatic and empirical concern would then be to cultivate what Donna named the art of cat cradling with those we trust not to snigger, with whom we share an informed art of disloyal fabulation. The art of discreetly dismantling either or, of either or academic habits, either you conform or you regress of confusing the gaze of inquisitors, of regenerating the taste for question which induce new habits of honoring what makes us think and feel and imagine. Yes, Marisol, I know that I still did not answer your question. I will try to do it now at the very end of my talk. In the Sawyer text, you wrote that the cosmopolitical finds its empirical reference in the slogan, a world where many worlds fit, initiated by the Mexican Zapatistas and later, later taken, taken up by the World Social Forum. And you ask, how can we rethink the West through the cosmopolitical and the relation between the West and the rest? I would begin by emphasizing that it follows from my approach that the question should not be posed in terms of the relation between the West and the rest. Indeed, if by the West we mean the devastating machine which is now in the process of destroying even sciences, the answer to how can we rethink would be in no way. If we speculate together about a reconstitution of worlds, the West then must be included and not opposed to the rest. Your proposition has forced me to go from, a, from the retroactively rather safe proposition of cosmopolitical diplomacy to the more risky affirmation of equality. All peoples cultivate a manner of animism. It is in these terms that I would then try and answer. It may well be that to me, as a European city dweller, alphabetized to the core, a daughter moreover to philosophy, which is an adventure of ideas. A mountain, a mountain is just a mountain, and a fish just a fish. But an idea is not just an idea. It is a metamorphic power to me. And I have to defend this power against its leveling by academic theory, just as Ecuadorian peasants defend their lands and mountains. I have also to think of the power of ideas as a dangerous one, which may animate or enslave, may be vital or toxic. I will not give to ideas a toxic power to decree that other than human entities will be satisfied by this idea of equality, which I propose that we are all animists and that they and their peoples will gently accept the constraints of politics, even ontological politics. The danger here with the West and the rest is that we should not hope that they willingly accept being part of what is defined as the rest, or that they pretend to do so and play with our guilt. We have been partitioned the world, our main task is not to continue doing so, giving to our idea of equality the power to define the meaning of the Zapatista demand, a world where many worlds may fit in. 
I have learned from Brian Noble that Canadian First Nations present themselves as treaty people. Why he himself had thought he had learned over the years to live with or become with the Picani Blackfoot, Brian Noble came suddenly to understand that they themselves had engaged him as a treaty person, belonging to the collective with whom they had in 1877 enter into treaty. From his point of view, he had only learned, as required from a visiting anthropologist, how to live with the Picani. But so doing, and without knowing it, he had honored the material and intangible transactions and obligations that for the Picani flow from having entered into what First Nations call a treaty that is, a commitment to living together or becoming together. And what I would call the treaty magic worked. It actively situated Brian Noble as part of his own people who did not stop betraying the treaties. It metamorphosed him, no longer an anthropologist, but inside his own people, what he calls an agent for anti-colonial alliance. I will not take treaty making as a new universal to be opposed to politics in order to understand the Zapatista motto, a world where many worlds may fit. I will just emphasize that only worlds may eventually fit together, may agree to, testing, to the testing commitment of a living together relation. Again, not the West and the rest. In Brian Noble's case, it was not the West and the rest, but Canadian migrants or descendants of migra migrants or descendants of migrants, and the First Nations with whom they are, whether they like it or not, treaty bound. In other words, Whatever the vivid interest of recent scholarly theoretical approach contesting the nature-culture divide, they will not do if they just encourage us to feel that we are not so different from others. I mean, if they do not entail the kind of transformative fright Brian Noble has experienced when understanding that for Picani, he was bound as a treaty person and was not free to disclaim this engagement. This is why I would claim that whatever the ways the world may come to fit together, rituals will have to be involved, because fitting together is not the affair of humans, but the affairs of people, and the operation must receive the agreement of other than humans' entities. And we, as the others, must become able to relate with such entities, that is to civilize the devouring power that commands us not to regress. Again, not to repudiate it, but to learn how to honor what made us what we are with the particular kind of immanent attention it demands. So my only way to think with Marisol is the way of SF, as Donna created, or speculative fabulation that of a regeneration of what is called the West, not its mere provincialization, accepting to be one among others, but in which kind of imperium. We of the so-called West will not be able to participate in political ontology as long as we have not learned to present ourselves with those other than human entities which, makes us, which make us a, a people and not the one so-called modern people, this one people who would be frightened by nothing because nothing human is alien to them. We may call politics the manner in which binding, living together relation will be agreed upon, but politics then will have the metamorphic efficacy of rituals, as when drumming convokes all those other than human entities who have to be present in a consultation, those whose presence forces to think not in terms of general mottos, <coughs> to think as situated by that which one cannot betray without losing one's soul. Political ontology, then, is not a matter of, the a matter of theory or of reflexivity. 
It rather demands what David Abraham calls an ecology of magic, an ecology connecting milieus where the, the dangerous craft of animating in order to be animated would be sheltered and fostered. I thank you. Do I get down or? Well, Isabel has given us a kind of a feast, which is um, impossible to comment on, and I didn't bring any drums. Uh, and uh, and I'm not a ritual specialist in any case, but I do have some kinds of questions, some kinds of ways of collecting up what I think uh, Isabel proposed to us that may um, provoke certain kinds of conversations that I would like to see enabled. And I would like to begin simply by showing a few pictures which partly recall, for those of you who were here, some of what I have tried to explain by the idea of SF or speculative fabulation, string figures and so on, the, the particular uh, way that cosmopolitical critters are inhabiting the work I'm trying to do. And in thinking with Isabel, animating cosmopolitical critters seems to be the task. And I remind you, or me, that SF is string figures, is scientific fact, is speculative fabulation, is science fiction, is serious fabulating, speculative feminism, so far. Um, it, its temporality is so far, uh, perhaps this pattern holds. Um, and um, I'm interested in Isabel's term of geste speculatif a term around which she's organizing, organizing a meeting this summer, inviting uh, the participants in this week-long workshop to produce speculative gestures, to jest with each other speculatively. Of course, one of the meanings of jest in English is to joke, uh, speculative joking, a kind of, um, a kind of uh, joking seriousness or serious joking that is perhaps the space of play where ideas might come into being. And I remind us of what Marilyn Strathern brought into these conversations, the conversations that Marisol has staged on cosmo, uh, cosmopolitical, indigenous cosmopolitics, namely that it matters what thoughts think thoughts, it matters what knowledge is no knowledge is, it matters what relations relate relations, it matters what world world worlds, it matters what stories tell stories. This was not written by Dr. Seuss, it could have been. <laughs> um, it's the kind of um, uh, iterative, uh, iterative uh, fractal quality of those sentences uh, that reminds us of what Marilyn offered that I want to bring into play with what Isabel and Marisol set out for us, which is that working by partial connections, that working by what Marilyn calls analogy, that is holding two dissimilar things together, not so as to resolve them or to build a compromise between them, least of all to somehow form an identity between them or for that matter a difference, but to hold two things together in such a way that one can be held still long enough to let it systematically examine the other one and then vice versa. Um, so that for Marilyn, the practice of analogy or the, the practice of comparison um, is a kind of SF speculative fabulation of thinking thoughts with thoughts without um, uh, knowing in advance or indeed even after the exercise what is true, but a holding still in order to examine uh, reciprocally. Mm -hmm. That seems to me similar to indigenous cosmopolitics to indigenous politics, to cosmopolitics, these words that are kind of swirling among us. 
And then I have just some pictures. Um, graphing SF, these kinds of images show up all over scientific papers these days as ways of ordering avalanches of data. The ability to handle giant di databases with giant cat's cradle figures. Uh, this is of course a kind of a, uh, a tree structure, but it's a tree structure that has become seriously psychotic um, <laughs> in its transing, in its lines of transfecting. Uh, or transmorphing. This is a painting by a, um, a contemporary painter uh, who is a Métis, that is to say his ancestors are uh, uh, involved mixed relationships of trading, including sex, between uh, the, uh, Indian Native American and uh, various European uh, groups, but his family lived uh, in Atlavik, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Arctic Circle of northern Canada, and he's an artist who has made it a practice to try to combine uh, various figures of cosmology, astronomy, shamanism, among the multiple peoples who compose the fabrics of the landscapes that he knows best. Um, he's easily appropriable by certain kinds of new age uh, shamanism, but I think his art is much more serious than that. And this is one of his cat's cradle figures. This is, whoops, excuse me, this is one of Lynn Margulis's um, cat's cradle figures. This is a giant painting about 10 feet by 8 feet hanging on the wall between the biology and the geology departments of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, and it's printed by some very fancy digital computers with some very fancy, fancy chemical inks. Uh, to produce a kind of vivid color that will also last for a couple of hundred years. Um, so it's, uh, it makes, like, uh, you know, the, the sorts of machines that allow one to read vast databases of molecules by high throughput analysis, et cetera. This kind of art depends on the machines um, of extremely uh, competent digital transmogrification, shall we say. And it is a painting, it is a speculative fabulation of the events of the origin of life on Earth, the origin of multicellularity, uh, the communication, the multiple communication of bacteria, the gift of semiosis that bacteria provide the earth in their own extraordinary chemical exuberance, their without stop chemical over the topness uh, that makes a, you know, a, a whoops figure like that, uh, you know, an attempt to account for them, but of course fails. Uh, this uh, painting uh, is, is an homage to the gift of semiosis from bacteria to the uh, sort of complexity that we call uh, multicellularity and it's coming into being, to the, to the peopling of the earth with its various congeries of strangers, uh, its various consortia of strangers in the uh, other than human peopling of the earth, called, um, the, the title of the painting is endosymbiosis. It could as easily be symbiogenesis. And then you have sober biologists, very sane and sober biologists, who write textbooks saying things like, we are all lichens, and meaning it in the most serious way, and going about showing uh, the, 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 the level of detail at which we are all lichens, um, at, showing at the level of detail how the premises of the intentional individual, the methodological individual, in, in immunological, physiological, anatomical, and evolutionary terms doesn't hold for doing proper biology these days. Um, and that, of course, leads me to the uh, writer that Ursula and I, uh, or that, that uh, Isabel and I both love, Ursula Le Guin, and her book, The Word for World is Forest, which must be assigned in a seminar next fall, along with Eduardo Cohn's uh, How Forests Think. Uh, for its, its exploration of lucid dreaming, the characters of uh, the word for world is forest depend on the practice of lucid dreaming, uh, where, which came up in uh, Isabel's uh, reference to Freud. But I show you these things merely to put some pictures into what I want to do with Isabel's talk, uh, not to hold together an argument that one might make with those pictures, but to, in a certain sense, infect the imagination with color for approaching Isabel's talk. Now, you will have noticed immediately that Isabel's cosmopolitical critters are ideas. Okay? 
uh, that they are critters in the strong sense of the term. They are what populate the, they are what populate the territory for Isabel. It's the doings of ideas that excite her. Um, uh, her, uh, her attention to her affective and cognitive and, and practical and technical attention to the doings of ideas is what makes Isabel work as a thinker and a speaker. And unless one takes her ideas seriously, uh, she will be utterly incomprehensible. Okay? So, um, if Marilyn Strathern is an ethnographer of cognitive practices, an ethnographer of thinking, then Isabel Stengers um, is a craftsperson, quote, three line equal sign philosopher in the sense of craftsperson. Okay? Isabel Stengers is a craftsperson philosopher for the building of lures, of propositions, of these very curious things called abstractions. One could, although Isabel has taught us that precisely to ask what is really real is the devouring monster to which we are all addicted. Nonetheless, I would propose for just a second that what's really real for Isabel uh, are abstractions. Okay? If she is to fall prey to that devouring monster that will tempt her to say really real, it will be to protect the abstractions for those who would make them near abstractions that the building of an abstraction that holds worlds together is fragile, precious, takes the very best of the working of, of uh, peoples, of people, uh, including other than humans, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. I'm avoiding saying thinkers and writers because I'm trying to avoid the methodological individual who somehow does it. Abstractions come together something like, um, the endosymbiotic entities of Lynn Margulis's speculatively fabulated, chemically very much their world. Okay. Isabel's abstractions have the quality of that painting and those lichens, and the word for world is forest, I think. So, with this uh, as my sense of the kind of work that Isabel does as a thinker in the world, the sort of SF world that she does, and that what she proposes to us are abstractions, then what's going on in the challenge of animism paper? And what exactly is she, um, what kind of fright is she trying to make available to us, in part as a way to hold open space for some kind of reformatted, reclaimed, other than human, and other than human, that perhaps isn't subject to the thou shalt not regress command, but nonetheless uh, is. You'll see what, you'll see what uh, the trouble I'm trying to evoke as I go on, I hope, I hope. Now, in addition to Isabel's clearly being really worried about animism in all sorts of ways in this paper, she also is really worried about this thing called concrete situations. Early in the paper, we learn that she's sort of annoyed that she thinks Marisol might be urging her not to deal with abstractions, but to deal with this thing called the concrete, and that somehow she had to produce cases and examples and concrete situations and the really real and the actual. Okay. Now, this is very odd in a lot of ways. I'm not exactly afraid of what Isabel was afraid of from Marisol in this regard. Uh, so I tried to get inside this suspicion about concrete situations that Isabel starts this, sort of uses to enable this whole paper. And I was particularly curious about it in view of the fact that one of the most important things in Isabel's cosmopolitics is the science's experimental achievements. So exactly how are concrete situations different from experimental achievements, I asked myself. And I decided that, um, uh, you know, and not to play a language game with this, I mean, one could fool around and say, well, this really means that if you just change this. But I decided what was at stake for the Isabel I was reading is that science's experimental achievements are those sorts of things in which the scientists put themselves at risk to each other, to their materials, to the answers given back that they neither intended nor wanted, to others who also have um, stakes in the, um, who have interests in the situations and will 
always engage them ag agonistically, and that an experimental achievement, something that holds, is always that sort of radically pragmatic, full of consequences, um, agonistic engaging that she gives the term cosmopolitics to, or uh, the cosmopolit scientific cosmopolitics. But concrete situations have this sense of walking into a room and going, land ho, I see who's here. Okay? Concrete situation seems to be those, um, anybody can describe a concrete situation if they just be clear, right? Uh, be concrete, just say clearly what you mean. Tell me what's really in play here. Just, the, you know, tell me the concrete. Give it to me because it's obvious. If you're just of good, good will, you can, ex you can describe a concrete situation. And Isabel knows that that is flaming neurotic, that it's completely crazy, that it's an, an extraordinary kind of lie we tell ourselves that precisely prevents that kind of being at risk um, at, the, at risk to things and people and operations and his, all sorts of whatever it is that produces um, an actual experimental achievement. Okay? Um, so uh, while I'm avoiding the notion of um, you know, critical inquiry, you know, because Isabel won't use that, and critical inquiry means something different, okay? nonetheless, the un- critically examined concrete situation is the one that Isabel is, is afraid of, is frightened of. Well, she's not afraid of, frankly. She, if she's ever likely to sneer or snigger, it's going to be about that, <laughs> okay? Uh, about uh, this notion that you can just be clear and describe concrete situations. That is uh, ridiculous from her point of view. Okay. So, I think I now understand why she's suspicious of concrete situations. But I run into a forest of odd terms, humans and non-humans. Never in Isabel's writing do we get the human and the non-human. But we get humans and non-humans. Uh, and they seem to inhabit, uh, a, can be made to inhabit, uh, civilized sciences, civilized, you know, civilizing scientific practices of the once Euro West, say the Euro born. Uh, although it's more than Euro born because Isabel knows as well as the rest of us that it's born in Arabia and it's born in China and it's born in Mesopotamia and it's born around the Mediterranean and yeah, blah, blah. That whatever it is that these, civil, that these experimental practices are, they're not just Euro born. That that's the odd fantasy of autochthony that is, that is born out of 19th century ideologizations of Greece. Um, it's Greece, Greece as the birthplace of Europe. Um, but I will forgive, I, I will not worry about that problem right now because I don't think there's any real disagreement uh, about that matter at all. It would be a, it would be a false problem. Right? In the same way that Isabel points out that the rest, the, the, the West and the rest is a, is a false problem for our purposes. If we get stuck there, we're uh, refusing to take on the serious stuff. But you get humans and non-humans. Non-humans, um, this is, she says herself, this is fairly tame. Um, you, diplomacy can be called for in these sorts of situations. And humans, or well, that seems, uh, you know, that seems to be non you know, defined as non, not necessarily, well, they may be intentional beings, but their intentionality isn't what crafts the stuff. They may well be intentional beings or think they're intentional beings, but that isn't very interesting. Whatever it is that they're doing is, um, it's choreographed in more, in more interesting ways than intentionality. Nonetheless, humans, machines, rocks, molecules, inclined planes, swinging pendulums, uh, bosons, uh, horses, part horses, archived mouse parts, uh, digital archived mouse parts, uh, mice who bite you, uh, all of the above can count as non-humans. Uh, and collectively, the whole thing is sort of more than human. I, that's how I understand humans, non-humans, and more than human in Isabel's uh, lexicon. And uh, I think it's a very useful lexicon. But other than humans seem to do something else. Okay? And other than humans and earth others, these critters that inhabit uh, you know, Val Plumwood's ecological feminism really easily, and 
that inhabit anthropology, maybe not so easily, but you know, show up there all the time, that surely were written into the Ecuadorian constitution over the dead body of the elected Ecuadorian president, or the unfortunately not dead body, I don't know, in any case, the guy who actually assumed the presidency. <laughs> well, the constitution, constitutional provision he definitely didn't want. Uh, uh, the, the other than human, there's trouble there. Okay, that doesn't seem to be includable within cosmopolitics and within the more than human. Well, why not, say I, being kind of uh, weirded out by that, shall we say, a little worried. And then I come across in Isabel's paper this very strange thou shalt not regress okay, around the problem of animism. And I thought, well, first of all, what's animism? What's regression? And why are we all of a sudden in the language of colonial developmentalism? Because Isabel, of all people, is not a, is not a positivist. Mm -hmm. Isabel, of all people, isn't going to give us the magic to religion, to science, progressive hierarchy. I mean, she's one of the people who shows how, how foolish that is. And Isabel, while well, she gives us a semiotic square uh, of, the, of the Escola, and we get naturalists and animists and analogists and who are the other guys? Totemists. Totemists, right, totemists and so forth. We, we get a semiotic square and we know how to make uh, you know, arrows circulate and we can do, we can do anything we want with a, with a semiotic square because we were taught the technology and that's what Descola gives us. Oh, I mean, Isabel of all people isn't gonna go for that. Okay. Isabel also has never been really a lover of biology until very recently provoked by, by her friends. Uh, and by which I mean, she is really, if you think she's suspicious of concrete situations, I'll tell you, she is suspicious of something like a, developmenting, a developing organism as something that ought to be generalized or even talked about much, uh, <laughs> much less generalized. I mean, she's against models and generalizations anyway for perfectly good technical reasons. But the, the idea that she would take this 19th century developmental figure uh, you know, the child and the problem of the adult regressing to an infantile state and use that to set up the challenge of animism, I was flabbergasted. I reached that page and I had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not regress. And I thought, well, she'll do that one in fast. But instead, there she was in the next paragraph honoring it. Okay, so I thought, what's going on here? Uh, that Isabel ha is really saying, hold still. I'm going to have to honor this completely reprehensible commandment, thou shalt not regress. By the way, I still think she should have explored the developmentalism of that all. And I think there's another commandment that it could be translated into, which would avoid certain, what I will propose are false problems, until Isabel tells me that they're actually not false problems and I'm just evading the trouble. Um, you know, because I don't think the problem of animism should be set up as a question of regression um, because it just carries with it all the baggage um, of, the, uh, of progress reg uh, regression and progression in 19th century developmentalism. And I don't think the questions that are being imposed should be hung up, it should be, I don't think that should carry so much weight in the, in the questions that are being proposed because I think Isabel is asking something more interesting and harder, or, or making inter more interesting and harder demands of us, like Marisol is too, in a way that sets up the question of the relationship between indigenous politics and cosmopolitics more it, it better. Okay? And then the question of, is there an, an indigenous cosmopolitics, or is that oxymoronic, okay? in the terms that both Isabel and Marisol would give us? Is indigenous cosmopolitics oxymoronic in the bad sense of oxymoronic, or not? Um, and if not, how not and so what? Okay. Because we know something about what cosmopolitics can do that we need, and we know something about what indigenous politics can do that we need, because Marisol and others, for example, have walked us through what goes on in Cusco when the mountain and, and uh, Nazario, who is a, 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 a ritual specialist who has uh, the capacity to make the mountain present. Not everybody does. <laughs> when that becomes a political actor in the nation state, 
Something's going on here that is way beyond the problem of tolerance. Some kind of politics, as usual, has been suspended big time. Uh, and it, uh, Marisol wants to call that indigenous politics. And that seems to me legible, important, makes demands. Uh, it certainly says something about what's been going on for the last few decades around the world is, first of all, the notion of global indigeneity is produced and its apparatuses and its institutions, uh, its uh, sequencers, if you will, its, uh, its apparatuses, and that in all sorts of places in the world, um, at, uh, at World Congress meetings, at demonstrations in Cusco, at confrontations at mine, uh, at mine entrances, confrontations on the river, uh, uh, at the dam, um, there are pressures, there are, there are entities making, uh, there are forceful entities making claims on everybody, whether you believe them in or not, whether you believe in them or not. It, it truly doesn't matter whether you believe in them or not. Forces are in play that are making demands, okay, um, in ways that are historically rather recent and very, uh, in some aspects, rather recent, okay, and possibly really consequential. There is a possibility for reconstituting worlds, just maybe, in a less deadly way. Just maybe. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, Isabel and I share the same enemies. Okay. I've already told you that I really know, and I, mean, I know big time, that she is not a positivist. Uh, that she is a radical pragmatist. Uh, that she doesn't uh, hold with the hierarchy of magic to religion to science because she's a radical pragmatist, because she actually wants to test worlds in uh, engagement with each other to see what holds and what happens and what doesn't. Okay? And that only those who engage, and it's not individuals who engage in a sense, it's peoples, that let's say uh, humans and their machines, let's call them a people for some purposes. I don't know, that may be a little st stretching. but. Uh, intentional individuals play very little role in the uh, iconography of Isabel's world. Mm -hmm. So, I'm beginning to allow that her honoring this commandment of thou shalt not regress, properly translated into language that I can live with, which it has not yet been, <laughs> uh, nonetheless is doing something really important that it's actually sort of anti-inflammatory and immune system booster as opposed to something that should raise my allergies. Okay. Well, part of this has to do with the fact that we share the same enemies, the knowledge economy, Lord help us all. Uh, turning ecology into a question of costed out ecological services, which you all know is exactly, uh, you know, the financialization of ecological services is something that a uh, person I went to high school with brought us in the Ecological Society of America in the 1980s, and I will never forgive her. Uh, Jane Lopchenko, actually, whom you recently met uh, in uh, National Aeronautics, and, uh, um, in which she's an Obama appointee, but that, that's another story. Um, she's, she's, good, she's a good actor, but unfortunately, the notion of ecological services, uh, the knowledge economy, flexibility, tolerance, truth over illusion, and assuming the power to constantly dispel, uh, to dispel others of their illusions. Okay? That kind of relationship to politics, to disenchant others of their illusions okay? in the interests of my truth, uh, which I know uh, because I have the power to determine what's real and what's not real. Okay? Because I abrogate the power to myself. I arrogate the power to myself, not abrogate the opposite. Okay, I arrogate to myself the power to determine uh, what's real and what's not. So we share the same enemies, okay, Isabel and I, and I think Marisol, frankly, at least some of the same enemies. Uh, we're both pretty clear that by partitioning of choice uh, and of commitments and imaginations is deadly. And Isabel proposes something that will make a lot of people mad. Inquisitors will come from various places on this one that those who uh, speak as indigenous speakers in various contexts themselves can arrogate themselves to themselves the power to say what is really real and what isn't. Okay? And that these moments of literalization and uh, 
claims to speak for the really real are um, quite as awful as if a European scientist is doing it, just as deadly. Uh, and that's going to get Isabel in deep trouble, and I hope we talk about it. But I have a sneaky feeling. See, I believe, I, okay, I, I forget the word believe, I have experienced as racist those situations in which people refuse to confront uh, those who speak in the, names, uh, in the name of this, that, and the other thing, but in, in subtle ways as well as not subtle ways. Okay? So I think Isabel, and I, I suspect there's not as much disagreement in this room as there might be, but I've, I've taught long enough to know that these things are inflammatory. Okay? So, at this point then I understand that by what Isabel means by what must be honored in the thou shalt not regress vis-a-vis -vis animism um, is not uh, some sort of sorting out whether sentient mountains actually exist, but a bit the opposite. Not sorting out <laughs> whether sentient mountains actually exist. And only if they do will I agree uh, to work with them. Okay? That precisely what this um, do not regress commandment is coming to mean in Isabel's paper, I wish I could find another phrase, okay, um, is, <laughs> is to leave alone the sorting of belief and non-belief, of reality and irreality, of truth and illusion, and to engage in, and, and again, we need another new word, civilizing just won't work because the whole issue of the civil is a problem, on the other hand. The civilizing practices of somehow being engaged in experimental practices where consequences are at stake, and not to, um, pronounce what exists and what doesn't, so as to eradicate that which should not exist. Because the pronouncement of what exists and does not exist, uh, or what is truth and illusion, is intimately bound up with the operations of eradication. Uh, the eradication of ideas, the eradication of people, the eradication of sheep, the eradication of mountains, uh, in, co in mountaintop removal, for example. Okay? That eradication and the um, irrigation to oneself or to some body of the power to decide what exists and what doesn't are intimately related. The power of extermination and genocide is afoot here. Thus, uh, what is at stake for Isabel and uh, me and lots of us is somehow coming to the capacity to smell the smoke of the witches in our nostrils now to reclaim, not to restore, to remember so as to go on, uh, not to be witches or to somehow uh, uh, claim to, you know, one doesn't have to mimic um, those with whom engagement is necessary, including engagement of, a, of a, an olfactory memory. Okay? It's not just actual witches, but an olfactory memory that has to be reclaimed in what Isabel is urging us to do. Okay? Uh, that um, reformatting, reclaiming um, is somehow the kind of SF work, speculative fabulation, worlding. Isabel talks a lot about worlding, uh, which I think is a framework uh, that reactivates rather than restores, that somehow animates in order to be animated by, in order to test uh, what, uh, you know, what, what, what comes into the world that way, um, and whether one casts one's lot with it or not. Okay. Isabel does what the artist Natalie Jeremy Janko calls building open structures of participation, and Jeremy Janko does it in relationship to the word zoo, which is a closed structure of participation, a structure of captivity, a zoo and she's doing animal art. And ooze is an open structure of participation, which is zoo spelled backwards. Well, I think Isabel's philosophy is an instance of German Jenko's ooze. It's, it has open structures of participation. And in, in Natalie German Jenko's case, that means that the animals can leave. In Isabel's case, that means that, you know, who leaves is really not under your control, whoever you are, uh, that the, the, um, the 
uh, ability, the power to leave is really, really important uh, to everything that Isabel means by thinking and by politics. Uh, it's an open structure of participation. So she's interested in metamorphic transformation, recognizing and honoring the power of what animates us, which is a lot more than civilizing. She talks about the transformativity of writing to, to illustrate some of that. She brings up Starhawk and, and contemporary Wicca and the goddess to illustrate some of that. Um, she, but over and again, over and over again, what Isabel is asking um, is that we learn, to, is that we be with, quote, those with whom we share an informed art of disloyal fabulation. Mm -hmm. Now, um, she wants to regenerate the taste of questions which induce new habits of honoring what makes us think, feel, and imagine. And to do that, we have to somehow actually experience transformative fright. The world we thought was there isn't. The world we thought was there is other than we thought. The world, we are at risk to worlding, and it is very scary. Um, and it undoes what we thought we were. Uh, you won't find Isabel using the term ontology, I think largely because she thinks uh, she wants to reserve for ontological uh, operations of uh, sorting, uh, you know, sorting what exists and what doesn't, doesn't, sorting what is and what is not. Um, I think that others are using the word ontological quite differently and that there's certain kinds of ambiguity in the word here. And, and I think Isabel doesn't use ontological in order to stay out of uh, these, um, uh, you know, you exist, you don't judgments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, remember why that's a powerful thing to do for a totally over-alphabetized urban daughter of chemistry uh, in the Christian, in Christian Belgium, okay? post-Christian Belgium, whatever. Um, everybody in this room knows that confet the, um, uh, confessional affirmation, I believe, uh, and the history of the hunting it down of heresies. Everybody in here knows the history of, of the, um, uh, the history of heresy in the history of Christianity uh, and the rooting out of heretics and the forced uh, act of belief. Coerced belief is essential to the history of Christianity. Deeply felt belief can still be coerced belief. The uh, I believe um, is a really, really Christian thing to say. It's not a Jewish thing to say. Mm -hmm. It's not a Greek thing to say. Mm -hmm. I believe is a specifically Christian thing to say, and it has a specific force in US Protestant Christianity, which Isabel is not guilty of, but it also has a specific force in Western European Catholicism and its operations. So um, the, I, the uh, belief and non-belief and truth and illusion are profoundly related to the history of the church. I think they're more related to the history of the church than they are to the history of philosophy. I think they enter the history of philosophy through the Christianization of the Greeks. Um, and that Isabel is secular in a way that um, we could examine in a Su Susan Harding-esque moment, okay? um, which is a, that there are ways in which Isabel and I are barely secularized, b barely secular. Um, Christian errors of Christian uh, needs to determine proper belief and improper belief and truth and illusion. Mm -hmm. So I end this little rant with the question I began with, which is, is indigenous cosmopolitics an oxymoron? Or making allowances for the different ways that a person like Marisol and a person like Isabel uses the word ontological. I think Marisol uses it for the force of the entities that have entered, among other things, nation state politics, like the mountains and the rivers and the stones and their people, um, their ritual specialists and others, not just anybody um, can have anything to, can evoke these, these powers. And these powers uh, act and press and have effects outside anybody's intentions or operations. Okay? Um, they are, call them independent sentient entities, but that's, a, I mean, essentials is so bound up in the history of, of debates in Western philosophy and neuroscience that it's an almost impossible word to use. And yet, 
and we don't have anything better. Anyway, so Marisol is using the word ontological for these entities that press in new ways, among other things, on the nation state. Isabel is avoiding that word, but using this, I think, reprehensible phrase, um, thou shalt not regress, in order, to ev in order to produce a powerful fright and the need to, um, the need to somehow lay aside the devouring, addictive uh, temptation of sorting illusion illusion and truth in order to be exposed to uh, um, experimental, experimental situations, in order to be exposed to uh, those operations of radical pragmatism and their consequences. Mm -hmm. Enough. If I, if I had time, which I don't, I was going to talk about how uh, the taste of snake weed in the mouth of sheep ought to be as powerful as the smell of the burning witches in the nostril and take us to uh, the Navajo Nation and to the uh, mass killing of the sheep and goats of, Nav of the Navajo in the 1930s under the rubric of carrying capacity and the preventing of erosion uh, in progressive New Deal, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt over and against, literally over and against, the Navajo notions of husro or right relations. Uh, and that to this day, the failure to somehow put together ontological politics and well, to put together carrying capacity in Husbro. To this day, the murder of the sheep and goats in front of their families and the rampant uh, increase in snakeweed and destruction of grasses and ongoing erosion of the, of the Navajo land because of the absolute impossibility of getting on together in conservation politics because of that failed um, politics, diplomacy, both of the above, between Husbro and carrying capacity. That's really, I'm really through now. Okay. So we'll begin with uh, give Isabel a chance to respond to Donna's provocations. And then we'll maybe start opening it up to questions. And I'll just ask you to please identify yourself before you ask your question. Well, uh, I did not feel I do not feel the, I sp did speak uh, very long, so I will not take too long to, to answer because I am more with food for thinking and, uh, uh, and uh, being honored by many parts of the, 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 the ex, uh, Donna's talk. So I, I think that she she she's true about she's really true about uh, better than I could say about uh, abstractions and ideas as critters. It may be because well I would say that even if I became if I became a philosopher in the European sense of the world, not in the U.S. sense of the world. If there is a certainty in my life is that if I was born in U.S., I would never have become a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a certainty. So if I say I'm a philosopher, it is because I, I really experienced uh, ideas as uh, life-giving, I mean, I, as making me alive. Uh, so, so they are really critters, and, and, but they are critters to be honored and feared. Because indeed, you kill in the name of idea. And I think this is not, it, it's something uh, peculiar to all countries and not, <laughs> not elsewhere. So ideas are ours. And uh, you, you spoke about humans, also humans are ours. In fact, this quotation by Whitehead I discovered when I was working uh, uh, about problems where, where the, the, the point of human was uh, important. And, and the, the first thing is that, in fact, it is Plato who said, we are human. I was working with Toby Nathan, an ethnopsychiatrist, who was insisting that for Bambara or Inuit, they are Inuit. Well, m maybe if, if people want to insist they are human, but it's not more important that, that they are uh, animals or quadrupeds or whatever. I mean, the point is to be fabricated as a member of a people. Or an ally. 
And uh, so, so, I, so, so the point was that Plato, Plato, the Greeks invented us as humans. So when I say humans, it's really about uh, the, the descendants of Plato that I am thinking about. What do you mean by humans there other than as a people? but as a species. Those who believe Come. that people are just particularity, but that the, the, our common truth is that we are all humans. Okay. Those are the, the people. And uh, that people who believe that uh, being Inuit uh, is important will be brought to reason and recognize that we are all humans, first of all. And this is our... Uh, so when I say humans, it's about them that I am speaking, but about myself, because I was t thought like that. And I had to meet uh, Tobinato and to, to travel to, 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 to understand that it was important not, again, not to repudiate this. I don't wish to repudiate my origins, because to repudiate my origins would be, would be doing to, to myself what I don't wish to be done to others. So, uh, but what I found in, in, in this uh, Plato's, uh, Whitehead Plato, uh, was that uh, the invention of humans was another aspect of the invention of ideas. Ideas was what, what was making us humans. The human soul, the, the psyche, uh, Plato's psyche, was what was animated by ideas. So we can say we are the people of ideas, if I follow Whitehead. Uh, we are people who, and ideas are, so ideas have, may have the status of other than human beings. So the problem is honoring them, receiving them because they are, they are all the more uh, uh, dangerous that uh, we can really believe they are all fabrication or the consequences of our neuronal <laughs> uh, mechanism and all that. So we have a lot of way of, uh, I mean, uh, producing the furies of uh, an imperfect realization of ideas. And so, and then I made the connection with uh, Abraham, uh, version, Abraham version of ideas, which he brings to, uh, he, he, he links to, to writing, to the spell of writing, and uh, which induced the idea, uh, the idea again, <laughs> uh, of uh, intentionality and uh, human provenance. Uh, so this is a bit complex, but it means uh, it means that when I say human, I say uh, this people who does not know it is one people among others, which which takes itself as humans. <laughs> and uh, when I say non-human, I just follow uh, Bruno Latour, who takes. But indeed. I would say that non-humans, uh, to me, uh, as Bruno uh, understood it uh, when he introduced it, uh, uh, include beings which may be of, a, 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 of common concern, a river, mm -hmm. but not this river with a name. This is why I was very interested by Marisol's use of other than human and try to have my cosmopolitics being complicated by it. Mm -hmm. uh, as for the do not regress command, indeed the point is not to honor it, but to, uh, to, to enter, it, to, but to take it as a devouring power <laughs> which marks that we have not honored and received what makes uh, what make us humans, <laughs> since it is uh, what did happen to us, uh, and it is important that we honor and uh, learn to receive uh, this fact, just in, in indeed to, to, to accept, understand, and uh, and uh, take very seriously 
the point that for other peoples, the fact that they are human is not a matter of uh, very great consideration. If we, if we remember that we were made humans, <laughs> uh, we can accept that others are made in another way. It's an uh, active pluralization. So, but I do not want to repudiate what is my origin. I want to, to have uh, the, the kind of cautious uh, reception the, which is needed in order not... And so the, the do not regress is a devouring face of what made us human. <laughs> it is the way, uh, I mean, it, it, it possesses uh, this was the point. So, so, so the point is not to honor the do not regress, but not to repudiate or to dream freedom from it. Okay. Okay. Because I think that the freedom to it, I would associate it a bit with some new age things, you know, which is then everything is possible. And it means also some kind of a... It has been all, uh, very often uh, criticized, and, and uh, but this kind of supermarket spirituality, mm -hmm. we are free to pick what we choose uh, in uh, everyone else's uh, tradition, since uh, there is no no limitation. So this is not something which uh, which I think it is something which exists, but it is not something with, to which which I think good to think. I'd like to say just something very short and then open it up. And it has to do with your um, example about Uncle Mouse. Yeah. The first patented uh, animal, the animal itself patented uh, as a fabrication of neighbor, labor and nature in a patentable uh, proprietary form. And you did repudiate Uncle Mouse. Um, and I don't. As patented. Uh, well, exactly, but that won't get you out of it, because uh, <laughs> human as species is, you know, sort of at least as horrible. Yeah. Uh, and I, so, uh, what it was, uh, what Uncle Mouse was about for me, among other things, it's an instance of a cyborg, a particular kind, a named river, if you will, uh, and Uncle Mouse is in no trivial way who I am through the very practical operations of sacrificial surrogacy in their laboratory formats. And the implosions of proprietary forms and sacrificial surrogacy forms and detailed knowledge of the operations of oncogenes in the uh, changing of the frequencies of certain kinds of cell transformations under certain circumstances that in turn comes to be extremely relevant, or at least the hope was uh, later generations of Oncomyces were much better, uh, the, the, the um, coming to a different kind of um, practical relationality with not just my own flesh, but the flesh of um, people, of beings bearing mammary glands, not all of whom are homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, there is, it, this is also an origin story of who we are, non-optionally and in a proprietary and patented form, but not a made-up form. It is not a mere representation. Uh, that Uncle Mouse is a little bit like Plato's human, or a little bit like Linnaeus's Homo sapiens. It is a non-optional making of the world this way rather than some other, and you can't just repudiate it or walk away from it, but somehow in your terms, reclaim it, uh, somehow Onco Mouse is now a player uh, in the world uh, of, I don't know, uh, ontological politics and of cosmopolitics. Uh, and, um, and furthermore, she is my sister, uh, complete with her barely secularized crown of thorns, you know, that Lynn Randolph painted. Um, yeah. And so can't repudiate her either. In other, your, in other words, your relationship to the proprietary forms of biology doesn't, doesn't work for me. But that will... But, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, 
I think they have the players in the same. They're dangerous. Yes, but uh, I, I have difficulty to, to uh, I mean, to, to think I repudiate Uncle Mose because to me she's also the victim, uh, uh, not, not only a sacrificial surrogacy, but also a victim of what is worse and worse science. But I don't think that's true. I don't think it's worse and worse science. I think you like it less and less. No, uh, uh, but I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, no, seriously, and I think it's because the proprietary issue and the, um, the rapid financialization of, uh, uh, to also, me, it's, and, it's, and it's, I think that for you, that is really worse than Ascension Mountain. Uh, in terms of something you have to shake hands with before you have your cup of coffee in the morning. No, I, 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 I think these entities are players in the world and that they're... No, the sentient mountains, I, 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 don't, I, I, I am just unable to shake its end. I mean, Uncle, Uncle Mose is part of my world. Yes, and, I, and we both uh, said that what happened uh, and uh, also, I, I do believe. Well, uh, I do. I really, This is something where I. I, I think you turn I, into a critic at the moment where money enters the picture with biology. Well, no, and I think that doesn't work. Not, not with biology, with knowledge economy. With knowledge. With okay. knowledge economy, indeed. I, t uh, I would say that there, I would fight my own indigenous politics in the name of. Uh, yeah. Experimental science. I think I'm more worried about Plato than I am about the knowledge economy. But we'll we'll worry about this. Later. Yeah. I'm, I'm being I'm being uh, naughty on purpose. But there's but there's a truth to it too. <laughs> no, but but as you know, biotechnology. I mean, what what is very interesting, and it's also my struggle, my uh, opposition, uh, which brought me in 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 a process, but uh, with a nice end. Uh, against a GMO and all that. I mean, uh, patents do not need reliable knowledge. It just needs correlations, which can be appropriated. So to me, it's uh, uh, Uncle Mo's maybe my sister, but my sister is misused. Well, we have more to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take some <laughs> I really profoundly, deeply, sincerely want to thank you both and Mary. Uh, because the yes. three of you, yes. Mary Trevor, because the three of you have inspired this seminar from the first imagination of it and throughout the writing of the proposal, that was a proposal to get the money. <laughs> and it worked. Shh, I should have said that. You are being We'll edit. <laughs> and to the reading throughout the year of all your works and the works of others that have also been inflected by your works. And Don, I have to thank you very much because driving here twice <laughs> less than two Do months not is really <laughs> something that I want to say thank you very much. And not only for what you were able to do, what you did before, what you have done today, but for coming here. That very concrete the place, I mean. <laughs> the I, land. I want to thank you. <laughs> and then, if I can say something, uh, I think I want to speak in the name of the concrete. And I want to propose a different concrete. Because I think that um, Isabel and I have been inspired to not care about the, what really exists through very concrete situations that have made us smell the smoke of the burning of witches in our noses. 
I think that one of the differences between Isabel and I is that that smoke that she smells and that I also smell through her is a smoke of burnt witches, burnt in the past. The smoke that I smell is a smell of things that resist to being, be, to being burnt and are still being burnt. So, uh, and that's why I talk about ontological politics. Because the other difference between Isabel and I is that I think that politics is not only ours. That the politics that is only ours is replete with excesses. And those excesses are precisely the smoke of that which resists being burned. And when you read your paper, I feel throughout this is ontological politics for me. And where I see ontological politics, you see <coughs> diplomacy, or are more eager for diplomacy, because as you told me yesterday, you also want to offer something other than politics. And that effort of yours to offer other than politics is something that I really deeply cherish, because it's your effort to slow down and to slow down that tool that has so much power and that lures us all, which is politics. So you want to say, slow it down, and it not only solves. And there may be something else that's not politics. And listen to that which is not only politics. But then I would say, OK, it's not only politics, but it is also politics. So let's. Let's talk about it as and through partial connections, which is bringing Mary III to the conversation. So yes. I, I think that cosmopolitics was indeed slowing down our political goodwill. Uh -huh. I mean, now that you have, uh, that you can speak, that we recognize you, present your objection, uh, join us and all that. Ah, you have no objection, you're just, uh, shut up. Uh, so, so I think that indeed uh, it's something where we, who, and I, when I, I say we, it's because of experience. And when you experience something, you, you feel you could, if you are not like the one you experience, it's just by chance. So you are like that. So, so when I see somebody of my origin, I feel I am like them, because the, 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 the difference is just contingence. Uh, so, so I, I did experience the, the, the enthusiasm with which we, I, when we feel we have at least a good solution. <laughs> Politics, I, I try to describe uh, ecology of practice, uh, pa partial, those kind of partial connections, uh, civilizing and all that. Well, then, then it, it's really worth being accepted by everybody. <laughs> so, so uh, we have, I, I feel the, the danger of this urge uh, of at last finding the solution which will be accepted, should be. And if the everybody does not accept, then it's uh, too bad for him. <laughs> but I think that that's the difference between the concrete mm -hmm. that you're used to and the concrete of that which you do not know, mm -hmm. which is as concrete. Yes. Like the earth being in the main square of food yes. is a concrete presence that I completely ignore and I do not know what yes, to do with it. And what but to me, abstraction are very concrete too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so this is not the point. The, the, the point was rather a uh, concrete situation, meaning uh, indeed uh, uh, what what means uh, diplomacy against mining company uh, or uh, uh, the scientists I know even if by goodwill are able to to tell that uh, their solution is a good one and uh, ingenious it's just superstition or, and all that so indeed uh, all all the, the the concrete actual examples will say that mine is only a speculation. So the identity of, of the West, as you present it in the story of paper, is 
the dominant reality. And con the concrete I felt was uh, to be opposed to that. <laughs> you see? That the, the, the West as such exists in th those mining. It is completely delocalized. Uh, it is in, in, in a process of desindustrialization. I mean, the West is no longer the West. Uh, but uh, it exists in those mining companies and in, in those uh, kind of uh, global enterprise. And, uh, and, 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 and against this, it is the kind of struggle of in, indigenous, be, be, to me, struggle is neither politics nor uh, diplomacy. Because politics, as I conceptualize it, means agreement to gather around issue of common interest with divergent position. But uh, so, so it's a, a it's not, it's not, uh, it's not struggle. Struggle is still another thing. So I'm here. Hi. Uh, so I, you mentioned your work with Toby Nathan. So uh, my question, well, I'm trying to formulate a question about the ethno-psychiatric space uh, that Tabina Tan created and the question of politics. And so, first, I'm, I'm curious to know whether you, you think about that clinical space that he um, worked in as possibly a political space. And I know that debates in France around ethno-psychiatry and his work have not seen it as such, but so politics as you mean it, um, like the you know the, the the for the common interest, and if 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 it is a political space, then I'm wondering whether there is something in that clinical space which is the encountering of different ontologies, of different uh, ways of. Being. I'm not saying of being human, but different ways of being that includes spirits and includes the concreteness also of rituals and objects. Mm -hmm. Is it possible then to think about politics as that encounter of different worlds where abstractions are also a world in and of itself, as Donna was pointing out? And in that mm -hmm. sense, your argument not being that I mean, if we are thinking about your argument in that space, being not that far from what Marisol is also mm -hmm. uh, thinking through. Well, I think that uh, uh, the invention by Toby Nathan of, I don't know if not everybody knows about it probably, but Toby Nathan is a uh, uh, dog. So, so, uh, in, in Paris, it created a special band of ethnopsychiatry. We call it ethnopsy in order not to decide uh, what kind of psi uh, it is. <laughs> and, uh, sp and he first specialized, and after it was uh, enlarged to, 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 to other uh, people, but o always with people who come who who come with a, let's say, non-secular problem. But the non-secular problem came to be, at the end, also a problem with institutions. They belong to institutions. But, but uh, so he, and he designed this, this uh, space as some kind of uh, hybrid space because uh, he is not an, an authentic healer, and he's uh, addressing many kinds of populations, so he, can, he cannot be one. But he knows, uh, but the, the, I would say dispositif, I don't know how you translate dispositif as a, the, the dispositif. It works in English. 
Okay. The dispositive is such that indeed the, the therapeutic process begins when the, the, the people recognize they are not alone. I mean, recognize or dare to say, because the problem, as he understood it with migrants, uh, was that uh, they, they felt that since they were in France, they had to, to, to be cured by uh, white medicine. So, so, and he received people who have resisted white medicine. They are addressed to him. So, so, so one way or another, other than human are convoked and negotiated with. And those, uh, the scene is always a, a public one, I mean, because to him, to, to be able to, to, to relate with other than human in all situations, in all tradition who know how to do it is a dangerous business. You can produce malevolent magic as well as uh, benevolent magic. So, so it's very, uh, very uh, uh, foolish to address somebody able to do that alone, face to face. There must be people. And here he assembles people who are students or co-workers, but to whom he, demand, he, he, he demands from them that they cultivate their own origins. Some of them are descendants of migrants, but also from migrants from Italy, but Italy is not France. Uh, some are from uh, uh, Maghreb and all that, but all have to come with, so that they will be able, and it's a kind of refrain and rengaine which populate the scene. Uh, in my place, one would, one would say that. So the many voices commenting uh, the scene in order for the, that it would not be the white people and the patient, which is a non white, no, a plurality of voices. And of, in my place, one would say that so, and, uh, pro and progressively, some narrative and negotiation emerge from those plurality of voices. So, this is a, a clinical a clinical space indeed, because what emerges is something which uh, produces the possibility to to deal with the to deal with in in, in, in the very active sense of dealing with uh, the what has been identified as the the, the cause. <laughs> uh, so, so it is efficacy and metamorphic efficacy, and I assisted that at that, and it's rather impressive as a metamorphosis of narrative. You, you, you meet people who come with really, you know, problem, um, woman, uh, woman, a spouse, a couple with problems, a couple problems, and and after one or. Uh, the fact that they are from this region of Maghreb <laughs> and that this was not done is flourishing and the people change. I mean, they begin thinking. And for him, the, the metamorphosis begins, is in people, oh, if this is what's happening, then we, they, begin, they, they become expert of their own case. Instead of giving the case to the wide physician, they, they produce their own expertise in, in, the, in their case. So is it political? For It has political consequences. For instance, uh, Nathan has intervened and has been hated for that. Uh, uh, widely criticizing uh, the, the kind of uh, n the, the, the way uh, uh, mutual uh, no, uh, excision is uh, uh, not criticized but uh, is condemned because to, to, for him 
uh, it's not that it's good or bad. It is just that the way it is done uh, has catastrophic consequences. And uh, so, so he, he was hated. Also uh, telling that the, the, the way uh, social service will take children out of their family because they do not fit in uh, and all that. So, so these are those consequences. Those are not political consequences. I would say that they are uh, consequences in terms of I, what I would call uh, political culture. Uh, uh, enlarging our imagination about uh, where, about uh, the non-natural character of our norms. Uh, but directly, politically, I, I wouldn't say because, because indeed, uh, uh, Toby Nathan has learned to the importance to, of the kind of ritual which convoke other than human entities uh, for, for uh, healing and, uh, and, uh, and all that, but the plurality of them means that if it has consequences, it will be through other channels because you, you cannot f fight a, a, have a political intervention as such uh, for, for all of them, I mean. So, so it, but what he has, uh, the, the kind of intervention he does is in front of the tribunals. So you see, there is a distinction. It's not directly political, but it may have political consequences on some laws and all that. Uh, this for, for what is a billion dollar. Uh, you, you were saying at the end of your presentation that the proposition, and my proposition for the seminar forced you to move retroactively from the rather safe cosmo, the proposition of cosmopolitical uh, Diplomacy to the more risky affirmation of equality, uh -huh. all people's cultivate a manner of animism. And Donna, you pick it up and you put it along in your slides when we are all like. And I was thinking, in contrast, uh, Isabel, you were talking about um, the, the, the move of uh, the scholar, his presentation, his very scientific presentation would be <coughs> I name the difference, we are one of all this difference, but he's naming what, what the difference is. Mm -hmm. So what it does to move from naming the difference to naming the similarity? And is it there a possibility, and here I invite you to speculate, is there a possibility of, of formulating the we are one among others, which doesn't imply that we know that we have the quadrant to say where that difference is, so that then the problem is not, we don't have, we cannot arrogate the, the right to name the difference alone. We can name it, but we cannot name it alone. That, <coughs> let's say that, uh, I, I say that uh, a, a strange equality has been created, but I also said that the this equality was not uh, something which I would say others should accept. It's an operation of, on ourselves. So I do not name myself equal to others. I try to experiment with the test of animism. We are also animists, but it does not mean that uh, the other will accept this definition. Or to be animist, or to be, it is addressing the, this fright of regression. It is trying to, uh, how do you say, with an animal which is afraid and you have to reassure him, uh, uh, not, not training, but... Uh, 
Yes. No, no, but you need a, a wild, a wild animal. We have the, uh, the uh, to, to approach uh, an animal slowly and uh, not uh, to make any quick move, and he would uh, move away. What is the name of that? Well, to acquaint with. Well, it's not tame because you don't want to tame him. You you just want to hear that he accepts. Be assured. Yes. Well, <laughs> indeed, I think that uh, this not to regress commandment is something. If we activate it, everything is that. No, no, we cannot accept that. So we would be lost. So the point is uh, to try to to produce the operation of kind of reassurance that it is not, the point is not that we have to accept that and it, it's where the really, really exists. Because it's really we created us and then we are frightened by it. But I, 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 when uh, the really is coming, is coming probably from the monotheist crusade against, uh, against uh, fetishists and other uh, I mean, but it is something which has been taken again by science. Because in science, in experimental science, really is a positive thing. Uh, now the X boson really exists. Uh, it, is, it is, what is to me striking is the, the doubling. It's not, it exists, it really exists which means that it has the power to defeat objections against existence. And this is the, the, the experimenter touch. I have the power to defeat doubts against it existing. And I wish to disentangle ex the problem of existence of the problem of defeating doubts against the existence. I don't, this is what I said, I don't think that uh, in the importance for uh, Mariano of uh, the, the, the mountain, whose name I cannot remember. <laughs> uh, the, the point is not to challenge others who would doubt its existence. So he has not this concern to say it really exists and you will not be able to, to put it in doubt. Uh, so, so the, the problem of ontology is, is different uh, if the point is not what sorting out what really exists and what is only an illusion, and uh, a population for whom existence was not uh, to, ex to exist was to be cultivated also. Uh, Bruno Latour was very interested by a similar point saying that uh, uh, fetishist people would say that yes, their fetishes were gods, and yes, gods could die, die away, if they stopped being fed or uh, on order and all that. So the point was not it really exists. It can, uh, it can, uh, maybe not the mountain, but. Uh, it's not defeating doubt, which is the, the stamp of existence. But we did it. <laughs> to us, exist is to be able to demonstrate you really exist against it. And this activates the do not regress command. Do not attribute this really exists to things you can doubt about. You see, so so it's re, it's it's a move to 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 reactivate, to remember, uh, to remember the the this this uh, this idea that uh, what is asked is not as dramatic as we do it, as we make of it. Uh, I, I am a, a writer who is writing a novel, know that when the novel has started, uh, the protagonists begin, begin existing. 
he or she is not able to do whatever she or he wills with them. They have their own demands. I'm still having trouble figuring out what animism is, mm -hmm. frankly. And I'm thinking of Villerslav's reworking of animism in situations of predation in the uh, in, in the northern Russia, and I'm thinking of the way the Avila Runa and Eduardo Contant are not animus, uh, but are engaged in a, in a semiotic exchange of very interesting kinds between Puma uh, and spirit masters and uh, Ladino landowners and so forth. I'm thinking of his, uh, his uh, argument around semiotic semiosis and the anthropology of life. It has nothing to do with, I mean, he's not specifically not doing this Amazonian scene in terms of animism. And I'm, I'm thinking of that our conversation my part of this conversation, as well as anybody else's, has lacked ethnographic specificity in a way that makes me really unsure what animism is. Um, and that the, those ethnologists and colonizers who built either the semiotic square or the hierarchy, magic, religion, science, thought they did know what animism was. And they really had a very Christianized version of it that really had to do with anybody, anything sort of non-empirical. Um, in, or it, it, you know, spirits, devils, uh, sentient mountains, everything. The, the whole array of things um, collected up under this category animism m still makes me have a hard time with the do not repudiate command. Uh, and I want something else here. And it has to do with this, um, this problem of equality too. And that, you know, just quickly, the we are all lichens business. Um, is uh, a, an affirmation that we are cobbled together and are not one, and that furthermore, we are cobbled together out of that which was once regarded as lowly, as lesser organisms, as the teeny tinies and creepy crawlies, uh, and that the higher, the higher man is not who we are. So it's an in-your-face, um, uh, it's an in-your-face kind of claim that also works off of beauty in certain ways, uh, the, the beauty of that photograph of the lichens and so on. Anyway, the, there's a sort of specificity. I want there to be a kind of a specificity to all that. And it's not about political equality. It doesn't translate into this other discussion, in my view. Um, yeah. I, I think it may not be compatible. It, it may be compatible, but it is distinct. <laughs> South Africa, the figure of anarchy is central, has been central to political life, to apartheid. Um, reading, as an undergrad, as a graduate, reading Matthew Arnold's Sweetness of Life, Culture and Anarchy was central to actually understanding the rise of, of colonial science and the ways in which the figure of anarchy was mobilized. The sign that provokes most terror in South African political life to this day remains the figure, the specter of animism and its link to anarchy. And I think what's really crucial is beginning to understand the rise of colonial science and the rise of animism simultaneously. And I, I think I'm struck by the commonalities um, in, in Isabel's discussion of academics and indigenous people both contending against the style of politics that is predatory. So it seems to me that this politics of predation. Well, for science, it's a new fact, a new, a new point, because they were. Yeah. The, the, the experience of, of modernist production is now counter to what the academic it is. So the wave is curled over. Um, and I think the predations of, of a style of politics, the, the struggle of, 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 of the predations of, of politics, of, uh, the struggle is against the style of politics that, that um, its predations are in that, as an academic, people, uh, one can be absolutely procedural and yet totally unethical. Mm -hmm. And in a way, if I think of, um, 
inability of the institution to speak against um, a situation which is totally unethical. Precisely because it's, it, it is unable to speak because all the boxes have been ticked. Mm. The, the language we have that is emerging here is powerful. We are able to invoke the specter of magic, sorcery, spells because it gives us a language to speak back to the ticking of the boxes, um, which are unable to, to engage with the styles of relationality. So coming back to the experience of South African politics, which struggles so with the figure of the traditional healer, the sorcerer, the witch doctor, the rise of, of the figure of animism is defining in an anthropology of coloniality, um, to, 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 to grapple with what if animism is not actually belief? What if animism is a, a set of practices of speaking against a politics of predation? And that politics of predation's way of, of marginalizing is to say this is animism, this is sorcery. So yes, to, to, to restore, to resuscitate the language of magic and sorcery in order to speak back to the politics of predation, to subvert its language and begin to speak new words. Um, and yet, at the same time, to go beyond and not settle for the language of magic and sorcery, but to redefine it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel uh, really uh, in affinity with what you said, because indeed uh, I, I, I wrote, uh, some, I know you know it, uh, a book uh, which is called uh, uh, Capitalist Sorcery. And indeed, it's, it's really not anthropological. My, I, I, I know a bit about sorcery system, but they are so diverse that uh, it would be meaningless, but to say that uh, this kind of predation is a something of a sorcery attack is useful because it produces the problem of protection. Uh, society with, with sorcery systems know how to recognize and to protect themselves. And I think that our secular society who do not believe in sorcery are, have also forgotten about protections. And so so to, to, to reactivate the idea of sorcery is to reactivate the idea of needed protection. Also to reactivate animism is not about any kind of theory of animism. This is what I like with uh, Abraham. It's, uh, it's not a theory of animism. It's really, to be, for him, it's really a body is made for relation. We need to, to, to animate in order to be animated. It's, it's, it's really, uh, so, so it's, uh, so his problem is, why did the world become silent for us, seemingly? Why, why is the mo this mountain a mountain? It is really his problem. It's an aesthetic problem more than a belief problem. I think we're going to have to end because we're quite a bit over time. But thank you for all being so